Welcome. My name is Benjamin Paloff. I am the current director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies uh, and professor of Slavic languages and literatures and of comparative literature here at the University of Michigan. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to what will be our last Kreese Noon lecture of the semester, um, Neo-Nationalism and De-Democratization in Hungary, Anti-Gender Policies and politics of resent and the politics of resentment. Uh, this will be a roundtable discussion uh, led by uh, Professor Christy Fervari, uh, and uh, she will do the introductions for our guests who are joining us over Zoom uh, from Hungary. Uh, before we do that, I want to make just a couple of announcements of uh, a few last items for the semester at the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. First, uh, tomorrow, that is Thursday, December 2nd, uh, as well as on Monday, December 6th, we will be having information sessions for the Foreign Language and Area Studies Fellowships. Uh, there is a link um, in uh, the, uh, the chat um, uh, for those of you who wish to uh, attend one of those information sessions for a very important and valuable uh, fellowship program for those of uh, you who may be students still studying uh, toward your degrees in um, Eastern uh, European, Central European, or Central Asian languages and literatures um, and cultures. Next Wednesday on December 8th, um, we have a, a Wiser Center for Emerging, um, uh, sorry, for Europe and Eurasia book series uh, event called In the Midst of Civilized Europe, the Pogroms of 1918 to 1921 and the Onset of the Holocaust. This will be event, an event with uh, Professor Jeffrey Weidlinger, uh, and it is organized by the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia and the Frankel Center for Ju Judaic Studies and co-sponsored by the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. And finally, a reminder that our MA program uh, in Eastern European, Central European, and Eurasian studies uh, called MIRS, uh, that's the Masters in International uh, 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 Studies uh, program, that application deadline is December 15th. So please do see our website for more details if you're considering applying for our master's program. And again, there is a link uh, to that in the chat. So to today's program, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, 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 Professor Christy Ferrivari, uh, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology, uh, a faculty associate of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, as well as a recently re-elected member of our executive committee. Uh, thank you, Christy, for that. <laughs> um, uh, she is a sociocultural anthropologist whose theoretical interests center on materiality and semiotics, with an empirical focus on consumer culture, aesthetics, architecture, and home decor, as well as popular culture and the body. Uh, she is motivated, her work is motivated by questions of political economy and historical transformation, and her field work has focused primarily on state socialist and post-socialist Eastern Europe, uh, in particular Hungary, uh, though she has also carried out uh, considerable ethnographic research in the United States. So with that, I'm going to hand over the program to Professor uh, Farabari. Good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today and very excited. We tried to get this program together last year. I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. Zentai and Feishman with us today. And uh, unfortunately, you can't be here in person, but um, this way, maybe we'll um, reach more of an audience. Um, I'm going to first introduce uh, Dr. Feishman and uh, Zentai, and then I'm going to do a little bit of a just a quick and dirty background of events over the last uh, two, three decades in Hungary uh, before turning the floor over to um, our guests today. And then uh, we'll have time for uh, question and answer. Just a reminder, um, as we're going along to post questions uh, in the chat. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Dr. Margaret Feischmidt. Uh, who earned her PhD um, from Humboldt University in Berlin um, before getting her habilitation at the University of Page. She is currently the head of the Research Institute for Minority Studies within the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Um, she, she is there the lead investigator on numerous grants and has been. Uh, her work has largely focused on nationalism, 
uh, ethnicity and minorities in East Central Europe, particularly on Roma, but also on refugees and immigrants to Hungary. Over the past decade, um, she has also been investigating new forms of nationalism, uh, racism, and the far right, especially in rural Hungary. Uh, in looking at structural and cultural conditions of ethno-nationalist um, inclusion and racial exclusion, her work helps us to understand the rise of the far right from local perspectives. And that's something that both speakers um, will be able to help us with, help us understand today. So not just the uh, political analyses uh, of discourse, but actually bringing us some sense of how this is playing out locally. Uh, Professor Feischmann has many, many publications, including over 10 edited volumes. The book for which she, um, she first came to international attention was co-authored with Rogers Brubaker, John Fox, and uh, Liana Grancea, um, called Nationalist Politics and Every Everyday Ethnicity in a Transylvanian Town, um, put out by Princeton University Press. And I should add that uh, Dr. Feischmann, I believe, grew up and uh, first studied in Kolosvar in uh, Cluj Roma in Romania, um, and speaks Romanian, Hungarian, also studied in German and English. So for us, that's incredible. Uh, her more recent publications in, in English include a monograph on new nationalism and popular culture in Hungary and an edited volume on civic forms of solidarity um, called Refugee Protection and Civil Society in Europe, um, put out by Paul Grave Macmillan. A taste of her few uh, recent articles in English, Memory Politics and Neo-Nationalism, Trianon as Mythomature, and I believe we'll be hearing some of that work today, um, and also Rocking the Nation, the popular culture of neo-nationalism uh, co-authored with Gerger, Gerger Kulai, um, which is looking at the rock festivals and the way uh, uh, right-wing rock groups are, are part of the way uh, the right-wing enters into popular culture. In addition to all of this, she has taught for many years at the University of Page, and I should add that both Drs. Um, Zentai and Feischmann were the co-founders of one of the first social anthropology programs in Hungary at the University of Page. Uh, she is also, on top of all this, the editor-in-chief of the journal Intersections, East European Journal of Society and Politics. Um, okay, I next turn to Dr. Viol uh, Violetta Zentai, who earned her PhD in cultural anthropology at Rutgers um, and is currently professor at the Department of Public Policy at CEU. Um, which is Central European University, which many of you have probably heard, um, was, was forced to move from Budapest to Vienna um, by the regime we will be discussing today um, in the last two years. She is also visiting faculty at the Department of Sociology um, so, and Social Anthropology there, and a research fellow at CEU's Democratic Institute. Until last year, however, Dr. Zentai was um, had been the long-term director of the Center for Policy Studies at the Democratic Institute. She was serving there for, I believe, over 15 years um, and also uh, serving as senior project manager, manager at Open Society Foundations in Budapest um, in some capacity for two decades. So it's a very recent thing that you've stepped back from that role and are devoting full time to scholarly work and teaching. Her research focuses on ethnic and gender inequalities, on socioeconomic transformations after the fall of state socialism, on European social inclusion policies, on, and on civil formations promoting uh, equality. She's currently uh, leading a multi-year project called Roma Civil um, Monitor with the participation of over 90 uh, uh, NGOs. Her most recent publications in English include a number of co-edited volumes, um, these include a reflexive history of Romani women's movement um, in struggles and debates in Central and Eastern Europe, um, and from the shadows to the limelight, the value of civil society policy monitoring knowledge in Roma equity struggles. So both books um, focused in part on, on issues of Roma. She's also worked on a number of papers focusing on anti-gender, which we'll be talking about today, as well as issues affecting Roma and refugees in Hungary. So again, I want to welcome professors uh, Zentai and Feischmann and thank them for being with us today. Okay, um, let me just give uh, just a really, again, uh, probably making those of you very familiar with the region cringe, but a very quick introduction uh, to those of you who, who don't know as much about Hungary. 
um, beginning with the fact that that uh, state socialism collapsed, obviously over three decades ago, um, but the effects are have never gone away. Um, it was not the the fast transition that many um, many people were expecting. Uh, this was uh, 1989, 1990. Hungary was considered to be very well positioned uh, for this transition, given that it had um, enacted many economic reforms from the late 60s and was considered one of the more liberal, uh, free of the uh, social states and also one of the most prosperous. And indeed, it received in the 90s uh, a disproportionate amount of foreign uh, direct investment, uh, which turned out to be a double edged sword. Uh, it, this did not brunt the difficulties that Hungary faced in the 90s um, in the transition difficulties that all of these European countries faced. Uh, it resulted in three different transfers of power, a uh, nationalist government first, then a shift to a socialist coalition with a neoliberal uh, democratic party, and then Orban Victor's first term in office from, from 1998 to 2002. Uh, so the, um, after which the, the socialist, I call them the neoliberal socialists, it's, a, it's, it's kind of difficult for um, people in the United States to understand the, the politics of that bloc. Uh, um, Hungary was admitted to the European Union in 2004. Uh, by that point, 14 years later, people were more resigned um, and then, then excited uh, about joining the European Union, although it still gave hope that things would change. This was also the time, however, of the rise of the far right. Um, and the Jobbik uh, is the best known um, and active, uh, active on the things we already know about, anti-Semitism, racism, um, the, the kinds of politics more familiar to us um, by the far right, but, but also anti-corporatism. So uh, uh, very much against the influence of multinational corporations and their effects on Hungary and Hungary's economy. Um, okay, so fast forward, uh, there the turned out the socialist coalition uh, um, was in power for the next eight years. A uh, big scandal happened in 2006, right after they were elected for the second time, where Yurchanyi, uh, uh, the leader of the coalition, was recorded as saying something very inflammatory about how they had cheated and lied to the Hungarian people, this became public and created huge protests. And so by uh, 2010, um, after which, right, the economic crisis of 2008 hit these countries very hard. Um, and 2008, it wasn't the end. Uh, uh, many Hungarians had taken out loans and mortgages. One of the few things that was a, a tangible benefit from joining the EU was being able to take out mortgages and car loans in foreign currency in the EU uh, and in the uh, Swiss franc. They were um, encouraged to do this because those currencies were thought to be very stable. Um, instead, they saw their mortgages, in some cases, double. Um, it was just a, a, a very dramatic um, hit. So uh, 2010, the Fidesz government, led by Viktor Orban, um, was voted back into power as much against the former government as in favor of Viktor Orban, at least that's, that's the general, general consensus. But with a two thirds majority, Viktor Orban took advantage of, of something that had been in the Hungarian constitution, which was that it, with a two thirds majority, um, the government in power could just enact all kinds of legislation. legislation. And um, one of the first things was to um, create a new constitution to get rid of the old constitution, create a new constitution, and then um, without much fanfare, just passing law after law after law, which eviscerated the judiciary, um, weakened the constitutional court, and did all the things most of you are more familiar with, weakening the role of the media. Um, and then uh, in 2015, this campaign against uh, refugees and, and um, immigration, and then the much more explicit and uh, advancement of what he called an illiberal democracy, which includes many of the things we're gonna hear about today. Um, and as you probably know, uh, uh, Viktor Orban and Fidesz became somewhat of a, a leader uh, <laughs> uh, in a leader in 
this kind of shift to the right among formerly democratic countries. Uh, and most recently, Tucker Carlson made a visit to, uh, to Hungary. Uh, this Hungary, Hungary is, has been coming increasingly a uh, darling of the far right in this country um, as a model and a way uh, of presenting and acting, thinking about um, rolling back many of the, the advancements in human rights um, and civil society that have taken place um, over the last couple of decades. So I will stop there and um, with this rather gloomy picture and uh, turn it over to our guests who will give us a much more nuanced um, understanding of what's happening. So let's, shall we start with um, Dr. Feischmann? Yes. Thank you very much for inviting us. I hope that I will be able to present to you certain rather symbolic aspects, but also the social uh, reasons uh, uh, standing behind of these symbolic changes. Um, issues related to the past and its commemoration re-emerged as pressing concerns at the moment when the young de Hungarian democracy began to exhibit serious signs of crisis. The signs of this renewed preoccupation with the past are manifold. They range from the overboarding of legal and political discourses with historical references through erection of hundreds of new statues all over the country to the commemoration of historical events that were irrelevant or in some cases even unacknowledged. This lecture focuses on a wave of memory politics one that commemorates national trauma and defeat partially following the logic of ethnic mythologies of the immediate post-socialist period and partially fitting to the fabric of nostalgia anchored in collective feelings of loss of the last decade. Kolovich and Zabriskie have identified the power of symbolic actions and mythologies in the resurgence of Serbian and Polish nationalism, as well as in legitimizing radical political changes in these countries far before us. A similar fundamental political transformation has been legitimized more recently in Turkey by reinterpreting the founding moments of the Turkish nation and reshaping the public understanding of its history. Similarly, Chris Hahn has proven, using the example of Opus Tassel, how politicians manipulate the national past in Hungary to authenticate the political representation of national grandeur. My main argument will be that the current wave of memory politics became the engine of new forms of nationalism in Hungary, constituted by extremist and moderate right-wing civic and political actors. Following social anthropologists, Gingrichs and Banks, the term neo-nationalism will be applied. Nevertheless, to understand the connection of memory politics to re-emergence of nationalism, an old concept of nationalism studied will also be applied mito-motor or myth-symbol complex. I will pay special attention to elites who play a major role in, in constructing new discourses of the nation and seek to represent collective memories, taking their diverse intentions, agendas, and strategies specifically into consideration. This view fr from above will be complemented with a view from below by investigating the meanings that audiences give to and the uses they make of these memories. Methods that were applied are fieldwork among activists and their audiences, discourse and document analysis of commemorative events, talks, and public displays. 
When I'm going to talk about the resonance, I will lean on the data resulting from a project on active youth groups in various cultural and political domains. The fieldwork was effectuated in 2012 and 30, which makes certain details outdated. Nevertheless, most of our research findings and first of all, the ways that nationalism has been mobilized and crystallized in a new set of discourses and beliefs to frame and legitimize the demand for belonging and reward is rather enduring. By the academic community represented by researchers working in the fields of political, intellectual, and social history has maintained a certain distance from the topic other non-scientific institutions have sought to put in the focus of public discussions. A new museum, new periodicals, popular musicians under recognition um, and popular musicians insist on the recognition of the trauma that Trianon caused for Hungarian national identity as one of the authors formulated. Since Trianon, we have always had to explain ourselves. We always get confused when we ask about our homeland, our national belonging. Our national identity has become unsettled and deformed after Trianon. The decades of communism have almost completely eliminated feelings of national belonging in Hungary, while all, all over the world, the most natural feeling shared by people is their sense of national belonging. This was a quote, which you can see on the screen as well. According to the author, the main problem lies in the neoliberal and global ideology, which excluded the topic of Trianon from public and scholarly discussions. Far less embedded in professional scholarly networks, yet wanting to play an even more significant role in the shaping of memory politics is the Trianon Museum. The permanent exhibitions of the museum commemorate the heroism of Hungarian soldiers during the First and Second World Wars, the revisionist movement of the Horthy regime, the national public monuments destroyed after uh, the First World War, the poets who sang the pain of Trianon, the, these, these are quotations, the joy and enthusiasm experienced during the short return of the torn away, uh, torn away territories after the First and Second Vienna Treaties. While the left liberal government that was in power between 2002 and 10 did not take notice of the initiative, the new Fidesz government offers them state funding and receives overwhelmingly positive coverage in the right wing media. The commemorations of Trianon were not initiated by the Hungarian state but various political and civic organizations, all of which belong to the far right side of the ideological spectrum. The most remarkable commemorative events of the early 2000s were organized by a radical youth organization, the 64 Counties Youth Movement, who received its name from the 64 counties which constituted Hungary before the Trianon Treaty. It presents itself as the only organization in the Carpathian Basin that does not recognize the borders drawn after Trianon. The organization has forged close, uh, close ties with the far-right party Yoti, who organized the first mass commemorative events on 4th of June. In uh, 2008, there were already several commemorations. The website of the organization featured a map which showed all the locations where commemorations were held simultaneously. In the past years, Jobbik has spent additional effort on the installation of monuments in connection to Trianon commemorations. The new generation of far-right politicians, the so-called Jobbik generation, taking advantage, 
advantage of the popularity of local trianon commemorations, used its newfound strength and legitimacy to challenge the silencing strategy pursued by black liberal elites. It thereby established Trianon as a symbol on which a novel kind of anti-establishment politics could be built. The official adaptation of the symbol by the new writing government and the subsequent political career of the Trianon coup attests the, mobil attests the mobilizational power of this uh, symbol. By certain figures within the ruling party played a role in the effort to establish Trianon as Leo de Memoir, the decision to incorporate the commemoration of Trianon into state's official memory politics was clearly motivated by the desire to expropriate an emergent political contender of a powerful mobilizational tool. Without doubt, the most significant recent change in the public memory of Trianon is a remarkable shift in the discourse of the Hungarian state. This shift has been uh, made clearly visible in the new fundamental law and one of the first laws which has been adapted in short time after the inauguration of the Orbán's government. The law on the testimony for national cohesion calls the peace, uh, the peace treaty signed on 4th of June, 1920, one of the greatest tragedies uh, of Hungarian history and emphasizes the political, economic, legal, and psychological problems that remain unresolved to this state. The new public memory of Trianon has been achieved by mythic and heroic narrative stimulating the national pride by anchoring in the pre Tianon pe uh, period and the idea of ethnic unity by promoting the ethnic bond unifying Hungarians living in and outside the current borders of the country. Based on a systematic follow up and analysis of recent political and media discourse, one can argue that Trianon became a major symbol in the historical representation of Hungarians of the Hungarian state on the 100th anniversary in 2020. The monument erection started by Yobi a good 10 years ago continues with the aim of having the monument in every Hungarian settlement. The new, the new monuments became the sites of the commemorations of 4th of June, in which locals and guests represented the lost territories celebrate together. Most of these monuments are reflecting the historizing and popular style of, of memorial sculpture between the two world wars. Some of them are even restored versions or copies of the monuments from that time. The idea of the national unity based on ethnic communality and shared pre trianon history has been converted a fundamental uh, symbol of the Hungarian state in 2020 through the memorial of the togetherness, which you see on the picture, completed for the 100th university in the very center of Budapest, in the immediate vicinity of the parliament from their monuments reminding the revolution in 1956 and the democratic tradition of the Republic were recently removed. Emotional mobilization and national identification were the main goal of the commemorations of 4th of uh, June 2020, the implementation of which has been limited by the virus situation. One of the major events was organized by the National Public Service University with the opening speech of the rector emphasized the necessity to remember and leave our Hungarians together because as he put it later, Trianon is primarily an emotional issue for Hungarians. Sorry, we are still here, yes. Um, um, the speeches of the members of the government highlighted the achievements of the last 100 and even more 
of the last 10 years instead of three. In the last section of this talk, I will address the discursive appropriation of the symbol of Trianon and the socially relevant meanings associated with it. Within the framework of a previous study that sought to examine the political attitudes and national identity of young Hungarians, I myself had the chance to talk to members of organizations who were involved in the organization of Trianon commemorations in the period of 2009 and 30. One of my interviewees who was active in the local yogi group in Dunaui Varush portrayed the Trianon commemorations as manifestations of community action and as occasions for the public expression of national identity. Among young Hungarian interviewees, there was a consensus that the treaty which, quote, forced Hungary to give up two thirds of its former territory constitutes a national tragedy. In the words of one of the participants, this was a gigantic nation and they cut its legs and arms. They left a small piece in the middle to show that there was once such a thing. The grief caused by this loss is particular in that possesses significant mobilization power. Its discussion triggers indignation, hatred, revenge, and revolt, emotional responses that can consequently be channeled into hostility towards the nation's enemies and symbolic action aimed at redressing the injustice. Such action is oriented towards the symbolic reconstruction of pre-Trianon Hungary, so-called Greater Hungary, which is portrayed as the natural manifestation of the Hungarian nation's economic, culture, moral, and political supremacy over inferior neighbors. Greater Hungary is not only perceived as the mirror opposite of the contemporary smaller Hungary, but as a potential relying site for national solidarity. Everyone knows somewhere deep inside that the greater Hungary was a good thing. This is certainly a, a quotation. So it has in a way become a symbol. That's what has to be destroyed because it creates community. Then. The mobilization of potential is exploited in vernacular objectification of Trianon good, such as the car stickers depicting, you have one of them here, um, um, the icon of Greater Hungary. Our interviewees highlight the importance uh, of remembering the Trianon disaster, as well as its direct association with the cultivation of Hungarianness. Trianon offers an avenue for reasserting personal dignity in a situation of disempowerment. This was brought home to us by the frequent mentioning of pride, which our interviewees described as something that they could achieve by learning and teaching Hungarian history, participating in commemorative events, wearing or displaying ancient and once repressed historical symbols, or listening to a new type of national rock music disseminated by an emergent culture industry. National myths, um, as Myler Idris notes in relation to the reinvigoration of German mythology, filter and reconstruct cultural memory and evoke nostalgia for an imagined past. The cultivation of mythic narratives depends on the memory vacuum, a concept introduced to express the lack of rational discourses about national history. Mythical narratives are likely to be more powerful and more appealing to a disenfranchised for whom alternative narratives that promise success in the fragmented, modern, rational, globalized economy appear either false or impossible to achieve. Stephanie Dehrles argues 
that the discourse of the far-right Italian youth activists includes a teleological project concerning the ideal society that is linked to a historical legendary and symbolic territory. I am convinced that neither historical nostalgia nor new forms of everyday nationalism can be understood independently from the social political context in which they emerge. Referring to the work of Clifford Gersh, several scholars have identified the nation as a narration, quote, a story which people tell about themselves in order to lend meaning to their social world. It is, however, not only meaning that is at stake. Researchers who have attempted to uncover the structural drivers underpinning support for new forms of identity and memory politics have argued that the success of new right-wing cultural and political entrepreneurs would not have been possible without the presence of economic grievances that compare those who experience them to confront the ideological status quo and its defenders. The narratives of our interviewees also highlighted problems such as the disadvantaged position of labor vis-a-vis -vis capital, the presence of unjustified social inequalities, and the state's inability to challenge this, suggesting that these play a role in the emergence of neo-nationalist and anti-elitist sensibilities. The analytical focus on issues of collective memory does not diminish, even less refute, the importance of social economic factors. Claiming that neo-nationalism is to a large extent driven by a profoundly frustrated national identity is not equal to saying that economic matters are irrelevant or secondary. To the contrary, frustrations related to smaller Hungary codes contain both, both cultural and economic aspects shaped amongst others by the peace and integration of perspectives for social mobility and striking Hungary's position on the periphery of the European Union. And coming to my conclusion, um, I will still come back here. Alongside other researchers who have pointed to the significant role played by memory politics in post communist countries, I have also argued through a focus on the rehabilitation of the memory of Greater Hungary and Trianon in the 2000s, that issues of memory have recently re-emerged as a central focus of politics. With this analysis in mind, I claim that the struggle between emergent elite groups after the change of regime for control over historical symbols and memory was not a unique event. The recent return of the icono iconography and discourse of revisionism to the public realm suggests that Hungarian society turns to historical symbols in situations of uncertainty. Furthermore, it also demonstrates that when a new generation of politicians set out to define its position within the Hungarian political arena, it too chooses historical symbols to achieve its cause. My analysis highlighted radical writing organizations effort to construct novel lieu de memoir and a counter hegemonic memory politics. This effort was centered on the resurrection of the Trianon trauma through local commemorations of the anniversary of Trianon Treaty which had been banned under the state socialist period and continued to be neglected by left liberal elites after the change of regime. I argued that this strategy was greatly had by popular forms of memory politics, ranging from the publication of semi-professional historical periodicals to the creation of historical memory sites. 
the success of trianonization is most clearly evidenced in the reaction it elicited from the mainstream right. Recognizing the power of the discourse and associated symbols, the populist right-wing government since 2010 entrenched the commemoration of the national tragedy as a key element of the state's memory politics. Although state-sponsored rituals have sought to domesticate a counterculture movement, the narratives focusing on the Trianon trauma retain a subversive, not to say explosive potential. This is because as a motor for present day Hungarian nationalism, the Trianon cult has set in motion a noble kind of nation building. Trianon clearly constitutes a watershed between the political and the ethnic conceptions of nationhood, as well as with an emotional instead of rational concept. The example of the renewed Trianon court shows that radical shifts in politics, in this case the shift from a presentist republican to a mythic emotionally a charged ethnic concept of the nation takes place through the activation of a previously suppressed symbolic repertoire. Furthermore, the emotional and mythical nationalism satisfies the need for recognition and pride of various social groups and maintains the emotional and mythical operation of politics for which for which populist governance is in great demand. And this is the end. Thank you for your attention. I will stop now sharing my screen. And uh, Violetta is uh, coming. Thank you, Martin. OK, so we are trying to make uh, a little bit the scene on site, not only off site, <clears throat> online and off, offline. So we are sharing with Margit one of our offices here in Budapest, and this is the uh, rearrangement of the space. <clears throat> okay, so um, my turn is about uh, talking anti gender mobilization in the democratizing and authoritarian context. A textbook case for that is Hungary. And let me just put my slides on show. And uh, I have more than I will be able to talk of, but with some of the slides, I just signal that these are some issues that uh, we might go back to uh, discussing the uh, uh, question and answer, but then there might not be time to uh, discuss all of them uh, in the talk. Okay, so. Um, let me start with a um, recognition as well as sharing information that the lead scholars of anti-gender political talks are listed here. Um, many of them are Hungarians. Many of them are mentioning most important to the ones who are Hungarian scholars writing not only on Hungary, but uh, many times comparative accounts of the region. And with this recognition suggesting that I am uh, doing serious research uh, on anti-gender uh, mobilization, but I'm not among these uh, lead scholars. So it's very important that um, they should be uh, read by any of you who would like to get more in-depth knowledge. And through those ones who are the most recognized scholars, you see uh, the names here, and I'm very happy to share the slides so that you can check this work more closely. Okay, um, my talk will come with some general where discuss uh, um, arguments and observations on contemporary far right, radical populist communication and mobilizations. Those will be just really highlights because that's the literature that many of you are reading and producing. Um, and that is something that is available on internet, libraries, and so on. Although there's a lot to discuss about that. And then I will be a little bit more detailed about anti-gender movement, mobilization in Europe and Central and Eastern Europe. And then a little bit more detailed as well, some interesting um, 
uh, empirical uh, findings, very contemporary, very recent, very contemporaneous will be presented very shortly. This is a research project, uh, which is called Genha, Gender and Hate Speech uh, Production in Europe uh, by the example of five European countries where I was participating um, with, with a colleague. Now, just highlights is promised common core of writing populism in Europe and beyond by Madi and Kaltwasser. You might be familiar with this little super booklet, uh, Ruth Bodak, lots of uh, work uh, by her is read. This is, the, this is more of the content, of the machinery necessarily, the political machinery, but the content split between people of the elite, nativism, enemy seeking, and exclusionary agendas. No time to detail those. Uh, political communication of the right-wing radicals are discussed through the uh, key, uh, uh, not just concept, but the key um, uh, practices and imaginary and discursive uh, uh, instruments that uh, radical far right is using. This is articulating danger in society, which is, uh, as Margit said, at times of crisis is becoming uh, quite pertinent. Uh, finding and, and showing multitudes of fears of which uh, one has to care and the right wing or the radical right wing is the most uh, suitable for that. Uh, actually institutionalized, enacting and institutionalizing politics of fear as Ruth Bodak is discussing in various uh, works uh, by her. Um, very importantly, uh, political communication on the far right has made very important and intimate relationship with online media. And this is actually where our research that I will a little bit uh, discuss more detail uh, will, uh, will more closely investigate. Um, it is not just uh, portrayed and promulgated, but it practiced that this online media is democratic, it's uh, open and it's beyond the edit control and it helps connecting direct, uh, direct links with the citizens. Um, the uh, general features of the online media is something that one has to start learning. <laughs> if one wants to do serious research at, about the far right. On the one hand, as Margit said, uh, it's better if you know at, uh, uh, at depth uh, the, uh, the, the, the historical memory, the, the repertoire of uh, national mythologies. That's how the past is always retold. But the other one is how the uh, instruments of the, uh, of the present are used and online media is probably the far most important in addition to our uh, historical memory of the far right to act upon. Uh, no time to tell the details. You are reading, discussing, and produce uh, this literature. I'm sure many of you. Here are uh, some, uh, some key names, some key concepts through which um, the general features of the online media for political communication are discussed by many uh, leading scholars. Um, uh, de-democratization by authoritarian and hybrid regimes is a very important uh, parallel and linked uh, development in Europe and beyond to the uh, rise of uh, far-right radical populist uh, uh, mobilization. De-democratization is not necessarily rely relying only uh, on uh, radical right-wing uh, thoughts, you can uh, do it, it's rare, but uh, radical left-wing can leave uh, thinking to de-democratization. Some of the uh, moderate conservatives, although there is usually a wall between being truly conservative and uh, being inclined to democratize, but uh, what is happening that majoritarian governments uh, use the tools of liberal democracy to deconstruct actually the, the pillars of democracy. Um, uh, coming closer a little bit to Europe and Central and Eastern Europe, it's important that it's gradual, incremental, rather than a, a big bang process. Uh, many times it is the combination or patchwork of worst practices as Greshkovich, one of the, uh, um, well-read and outstanding uh, uh, um, uh, political scientists are arguing. And Hungary can be considered and actually is considered by, by many as the textbook case of destructive creativity and effic efficiency uh, of this kind of de-democratization by authoritarian um, uh, uh, practices, power practices, and taking advantage of a favorable historical context and unfortunately shaping that context. Okay, um, 
very briefly why it matters. In addition that, of course, everything matters, which has um, major power influence over people's thinking, imagination, uh, uh, collective uh, understanding, and so on. Uh, it is becoming um, particularly le relevant, I would say even formidable, when social visions, discursive formations, and policy proposals are assembled. And for that matter, like in Hungary, they are uh, practiced together by a very capable um, de-democratizing authoritarian regimes. Uh, then uh, uh, gender uh, comes, not the only one, but one of the important uh, tool and target to actually uh, realign competitive relations um, between anti-equality forces mobilize ac uh, across social groups who may not be immediately inclined to uh, take all the anti-equality um, uh, uh, imagination and actually serving other enemy seeking in other domains like civil society, academia, uh, international human rights machineries. Um, the uh, um, goal as well as the instrument to uh, bring together vision, discursive formations and policy proposals is to reverse, actively reverse various equality achievements that previous human rights, liberal democratic uh, regimes institutionalized. And not only reverse uh, equality achievements, uh, but reinstitute or reinforce social hierarchies. Um, okay, we are coming closer to gender. And gender backlash by radical right wing, um, uh, imaginaries, uh, mobilizations, um, uh, discursive um, uh, complexes in Europe and beyond. It's not incidental and it's called complex. There is no time to discuss that, but we can go back to that. It's very clear that it's moving away from conservative feminism, which originally opposed reproductive and sexual rights. And it's going against uh, key values of individualism, human rights and gender equality. Um, uh, some argue that there is uh, gender, delegitimizing gender as a concept, especially gender equality, is a symbolic glue between the uh, far right and conservative uh, parties. Um, very importantly, there is a new universalism emerging, actually enacted, it's not just emerging, by default it's enacted, actively enacted, uh, in the center of the rights of the family, not just the family, life of the family, but the rights of the family, and protecting religious, uh, nationalist, other uh, groups that are allegedly uh, in danger. Uh, or whose rights should be protected uh, against uh, 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 liberals, progressives, leftists, and, and you name it. It is becoming a transnational political mobilization. Many argue that this is a classical counter-hegemonic uh, movement in a Gramscian sense, but you know, reversing the, the, uh, the side. And in a broader sense, it's a sense-making of the world, uh, in particular uh, at crisis, involving those ones whose place is not directly uh, endangered in, in this crisis. That's the formidable efficiency of this kind of mobilization. Now, uh, coming closer to uh, the region, um, there are wonderful authors, for example, Korolchuk and Graf, uh, who discuss uh, anti-gender mobilization specifically in post-socialist context. And they highlight that you know, what is played upon and uh, instrumentalized some kind of feeling, uh, uh, um, discussions uh, lingering behind in the post-socialist socialist changes that uh, Christina Fehervari uh, briefly discussed that this region is not fully spoiled. It's not fully colonized by Western ideas um, and ideologies. There is some authenticity here, uh, which now is probably threatened. You know, the crisis is not incidental and maybe we are left uh, on our own so this is combining some less uh, sense of victimhood and superiority vis-a-vis -vis Western culture and ideology. And um, there is a peculiar, uh, um, full of tensions and contradictions, but very nicely lays together ideas of referring to the uh, uh, global South as the uh, potential ally in post-colonial struggle against the uh, West 
and uh, identifying, for example, Brussels with the, uh, with the Ebola, right? It's like a, a spread, which is a dangerous uh, virus, which tries to uh, uh, encroach on the uh, humankind in all parts of the world. Um, we will come maybe in the discussion to a more sensitive agenda, how, uh, how anti-gender or critique of gender uh, in as the second wave feminist, um, uh, feminist uh, articulated, are uh, criticized not only by far right and uh, radical uh, right wingers. Okay, what are the enabling conditions to embrace gender sexuality and gender identity by this uh, right wing uh, popular uh, complexes? I will not discuss it, but if there is interest in the, uh, in the discussion, we can come back to one of the most interesting questions is that why, why it is happening so uh, efficiently, right? What are, what, are, what are these enabling conditions? Uh, you see some of the uh, key words here, but we will not get into this discussion right now. Now, let me tell a few words about the uh, Gen Hot Research Project. Uh, the full name is, the official name is Hate Speech, Gender, Social Networks and Political Parties. But in fact, it has been a, a research on anti-gender hate speech in populist right-wing social media communication. What is important, it's not social network in a general sense, but social media communication. I mentioned how important uh, to learn into, at least to some extent understand or talk to those researchers who understand the uh, operation of social media, which is a dynamic, quickly changing phenomenon. Uh, we made an effort with our colleagues here, um, very honestly with very uh, little uh, uh, understand, not, not little, very little research experience, um, very, um, minimalist, qualitative, uh, very simple research in social media beforehand, but this was a more uh, demanding undertaking. We covered five countries. Uh, it's supported by EU, but it doesn't matter too much. And uh, Hungary was one of the uh, members. And with my colleague Anna Fejus, we actually uh, produced a larger synthetic report of this social media research. We hope to publish uh, several um, uh, um, interesting um, pieces from this um, quite thick and complex research very soon. But some of the most important um, findings and some open questions and some, some early conclusions or uh, in a very uh, selective ways. Um, the core puzzle for us was, um, or if you wish, a very strong uh, starting point that hate creates subordination, the production of hate in political communication itself can produce subordination and exclusion, not only when it is translated to policies and political uh, um, in instruments or in in institutions, okay? So the hate speech itself is able to produce subordination. It is debated in the uh, communication literature, political literature, and so on. Second, that in the 2010s, tons of literature on that, uh, the uh, uh, writing parties started and very quickly as uh, professionalized their political communication by becoming creative and fast learners of uh, social media, in particular Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and uh, in the US there are other ones which are actually becoming even more important. In Europe, these are the two most important ones with the addition that, uh, with the addition information that YouTube is becoming more and more, ever more important among the, uh, the, 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 the new generation. And what we see that they compete with each other, they are very much embedded into a national understanding, nativist understanding uh, of, of the potentials, of the specificity of the language they can use. Um, they, there is a transnational learning among them. There's no time to discuss the details, but there's a growing literature uh, on that. One of the key questions for us was in addition to understanding the uh, relevance of anti-gender, so the content is that whether this kind of political talks, in particular in the uh, radical far right, is a spiral within their own bubbles, or it is something which creates some kind of powerful depths of hate. We will come back to that. This is a concept that um, Bodak, Sauer, uh, lots of actually most importantly Central European, but not only post socialist, Austrian and German scholars together discuss uh, very intensively for, for good reason. So powerful webs of hate, which cross, uh, which potentially cuts across 
the political forces and not only allying far right and more moderate right, but as I will refer to that, involving in the uh, uh, um, in the uh, um, uh, commentaries, right, involving the uh, those ones who are dissecting or resisting the far right ideas into their own communication spaces. Okay, um, but the research covered See, uh, social media communication. Who are Time is really very fast. Of two years, mostly uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, 19 and 21. We used social media listener. This is a, a, a software, but you have to need, you know, you need some knowledge to add to the software, but it is able retroactively to uh, watch and collect information of social media public uh, sites uh, retroactively or contemporaneous uh, manner. We studied parties who are in the parliament, politicians, uh, say uh, important politicians, national or European politics, and uh, actors who are connect, uh, connected to the uh, far right or the popular right, populist right, civil platforms, fan clubs, think tanks, and so on. And we identified anti-gender by free content, if you wish, free components, uh, sexism, or uh, for good reason, it's also called anti-feminism, homophobia, it's also called anti-LGBTQI, and anti-genderism, that's a difficult concept, so it's too close to anti-gender, but at the same, at the moment, we don't have a better one. This is not our invention, the literature is using that. This is the um, mobilization, denial, uh, defamation of gender equality ideas, machineries, and most important political and policy actors. Of course, it overlaps sexism to some extent, but it is about gender equality, okay? So it's not about women who stand up and uh, have a public role. Sexism is more typically, but it is, it is a, a, a against gender equality. Okay, so descriptive uh, research, you can turn the page, but the qualitative was about to understand the modalities of, modalities of online hate speech. What I'm showing very briefly here, sorry for the small um, letters, but very happy again um, to share the whole presentation. This is partly the starting point, but this is partly the result uh, or interim results of our research. That was an initial uh, understanding by uh, the, the, the German colleagues, how you can classify hate speech by the salience, by the uh, content of hate that it contains or, or it generates. And the three, uh, actually four broad, broad categories, hate speech in a narrow sense, which is even legally would qualify for hate speech, right? We can, which can be prosecuted in most of the uh, um, uh, still democratic um, polities. Uh, probably the most interesting, of course, many times as the middle, right? The hate speech broad, we called it. Uh, I will get to some of the uh, modalities of that, which are clearly doing uh, certain speech acts by which they are going against, and this is the list against what and how, uh, but legally they are not qualifying as hate speech, right? So they, they are not uh, uh, qualifying to the, uh, the, the wrongdoings by criminal code, but they are uh, generating hate in or able to generate hate. Uh, the third one is hate speech potential. You know, that's a classical othering, which is always close to or separated with a fine line with uh, a, um, attacking or de debasing, uh, demonizing, um, uh, the other, but not necessarily. There are soft ways of othering. And the, the fourth one, which we call broad political communication. There is no time to tell the, the, the details, but uh, the research showed that in the three particular themes, sexism, um, homophobia, and anti-genderism, these modalities, that restriction, calling for restriction of rights of those who are advocating, right? for gender equality or LGBT, defamation, protecting the mainstream against those ones, delegitimation, right? How those are enacting, right? What uh, instruments they are using, what themes, whether these are more the politicians, these are more the political parties, or these are more of these so-called civic platforms or think tanks that are uh, uh, developing this, this uh, discursive tools and reasoning. Uh, Christy, I have how many? Two minutes? Three? Zero, right? 
I can't hear you, Christy. Um, two. A few, a few more minutes, yes. A few more, okay, that's enough. All right, so uh, selective conclusions. Um, maybe it's interesting to really have some, down to some, some really fine details. Uh, in Hungary, um, the vocal opposition of women politi politicians are the main targets of sexism, small surprise. But in LGBTQ, it's not the LGBTQ people, but the LGBTQ advocates who are the most important targets of homophobia. In anti-genderism, far from being uh, obvious, this is Brussels, right? So the European Union as a container of uh, progressive gender ideas, Istanbul Convention, some of you are familiar, some of you not, maybe in the discussion, this is the far uh, most uh, comprehensive and progressive um, international convention against the, um, uh, 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 the, 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 against gender violence and state uh, duties against violence, left-wing liberal artist writers, right? So that's uh, because no time to tell, there are very important vocal, but not necessarily very well-known uh, feminist, uh, feminist organization, women's organization, women's rights organization. It's much easier, it's much in social media to go against uh, left liberal artist writers. Um, very, uh, very uh, widespread throughout the five countries, contracting out the, the, the sharpest form of hate, right? Hate speech. It's not the, 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 the established parties in Hungary, it's not the Fidesz who is putting out the most vocal and nasty uh, hate related anti gender statements, anti gender in this triadic understanding, but it's minor parties, the Christian Democratic parties, really, really super nasty. Uh, uh, stuff uh, and online platforms, civic groups, so-called public intellectuals. Uh, very interesting that in Europe, um, for political communication for the public, not uh, political parties among themselves, it is uh, Facebook, which is clearly ruling. So it's very interesting that in the States, I know it's, it's somewhat different. Uh, Twitter is much more important. In Europe, this is Facebook, which has some uh, consequences and reasons. No time to talk about three very important well-known reversal mechanisms, how the human rights language is appropriated actually by the right-wing radical and turns against those ones who are critiquing hate, critiquing uh, uh, anti-equality thinking. Uh, there is one version that I research did not do, but lots of colleagues that I mentioned on the very first slide are doing how the radical right, when it is institutionalized through authoritarian de-democratizing states, or maybe not fully de-democratizing, but just authoritarian, appropriate and reinterpret some of the essential components of the women's rights agenda. They are, you know, they are putting themselves as the warriors uh, or the... Um, uh, soldiers uh, or the leaders of uh, women rights, of course, in a, in a particular way. Um, interestingly, right-wing populist women appeal many times to the potential women followers. It's not the case in Hungary, I can tell more the details, but for example, in Spain and Italy, the ugliest attack against the feminists are sped out and acted again, uh, um, performed by the, uh, the, the radical women um, politicians. Um, yeah, interestingly, uh, and this is something that I very uh, briefly mentioned, this is where I research uh, had not been able to be very detailed, but we did, right? Very important and detailed analysis, but this is far more the most uh, uh, challenging and, and forward-looking uh, element of our research that lots of lots of support uh, dissenting voices appear in the comments. So this is this uh, famous bubble idea to, to some extent works, but in many of these uh, right-wing radical communications, you see lots of lots of dissenting people who are taking the time, taking the courage with their uh, 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 Facebook page and Twitter to speak back, to speak back. And uh, there are varieties or modalities how they speak back. Actually, very interestingly, some of them are resonating and 
responding with sexism. <laughs> they are, for example, to the right-wing populist women, they are reacting with sexism, but the more established, more, uh, let's say, soft conservative, they are reacting differently, but that's not the only uh, division. Um, and finally, and I would stop here, and in the discussion, I would be very happy to give some examples, of course, what is at stake here, right? On the one hand, of course, it is about political communication. It is about freedom of speech. It is about uh, the limits of producing hate and by hate creating exclusion, undermining equality, uh, thinking, but more importantly, when these kind of messages are translated, informing or directly um, making policy, legal, and constitutional changes. And some of them we experienced in Hungary. So a couple of painful examples I'm very happy to give in the discussion uh, about uh, changing the constitution, which is called um, basic law, changing very important um, legislation. Here, something which is very telling. This is, for example, how the uh, some of the uh, well-known, uh, very popular far-right so-called public intellectual who is uh, um, uh, often um, working with right-wing media, but also he has his own blog and social media site. This is how nicely, uh, for example, he presents uh, the, uh, you can tell that the upper line is the uh, oppositional women politicians in the parliament and the lower line uh, are the, um, um, conservative, radical conservative uh, parties. Very importantly, we consider uh, Fidesz is a right-wing party, no question. They never would call themselves radical, but they are a right-wing party. These women are always happy. These women are always smiling, and these women are never angry. No? It's well known, that's not a Hungarian, but this is just an illustration for uh, wrapping up my talk. Thank you for your attention. Okay, hey, um, thank you so much for those fascinating talks. There's so much more to be said. Um, while we're, so please, uh, people in the audience, please post your uh, questions to the box. Um, while we're waiting for you to uh, uh, post questions, I'll, I'll start by just throwing out a couple of things to talk about. First of all, I, Viola, if you could just say, because I think I think some people don't know, um, there's some very shocking uh, legislation that's passed in Hungary over the last year or two. Mm -hmm. So if you mm -hmm. could just, just say that, and then I have a couple of, of things to okay discussion. All right, okay. So one is that uh, in, for example, it's very selective, but enough to uh, hear some or listen to some of them. In 2018, uh, the Hungarian government with a, uh, I think it was a government decree, um, simply uh, erased gender studies uh, from the list of accredited MA studies programs in Hungary. Uh, it concerned one established really, really wonderful program at ELTE, the biggest uh, Hungarian university in Budapest. And it partially concerned the CEU, but the CEU's gender studies program uh, has been accredited in the US as well. So it does have an, it, it did not directly, I mean, it was of course a very symbolic violence if you wish, but it did not concern. So that's one thing, attack through anti-gender, uh, 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 attacking gender in academia and through anti-gender attacking uh, independent universities. Um, uh, 2020, uh, May, the Hungarian parliament after some preparatory kind of discourses, so it was expected that it would happen, it stopped uh, the uh, ratifying process of the Istanbul convention, the, the Hungarian state signed the Istanbul Convention. As I said, this is the most recent, most comprehensive global, um, um, more and more contested, but very progressive uh, uh, gender um, violence, um, uh, prevention of gender violence uh, uh, convention. Ironically, it was signed in Istanbul. That's the, uh, that's the, um, that's the name. And uh, Turkey actually is the one who literally stabbed out of it. Mm -hmm. Hungary did not. 
So the Hungarian government was a little bit more cautious for who knows why, maybe we can, but it's just a study, it's, uh, uh, legally it announced that it would stop the process of uh, ratifying the, uh, the convention. Uh, so it left the, uh, the back door open if you wish. Um, in 2020, uh, in a so-called mixed salad, that's a very favorite uh, way of changing legislation on all kinds of things, just uh, put it into a, a bowl, uh, incredibly diverse, uh, uh, it's the famous Chinese library <laughs> type of thing, um, uh, all kinds of um, needed for legislative changes. And uh, it uh, literally a banned changing one's uh, biological sex um, in Hungary, um, which was a very clear kind of uh, actual and, and symbolic again, uh, attack against uh, uh, trans or non-binary uh, people. Uh, and finally, probably one of the most um, recent, one of the most complex, uh, and if you wish, uh, if you wish, hate-based and shrewd type of legislation is to um, um, ban the adoption, uh, the possibility of, of, of being adopted, uh, adopting a single parent, and of course, a single sex couples. It's done, it's done in a positive way, saying that only uh, married couples, uh, married heterosexual couples can be considered as adopting parents, and again, leave the door, tiny, tiny door, uh, tied to the authority of the uh, um, minister without portfolio responsible for family affairs to give very special individualized permit for those uh, for single for single parents and finally uh, in uh, one of the uh, 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 ex the so ninth amendment to the fundamental law um, the uh, Hungarian parliament um, stipulated the mother is female and the father is male. So very clearly uh, making a strong statement uh, allegedly in protection of children's rights that uh, it will uh, protect uh, uh, heterosexual marriage beyond all reasons and uh, in, in, the, in the name of the, uh, of the children. So changing uh, um, um, uh, civil code on adoption, changing the um, uh, constitution, changing um, the, uh, um, uh, that's, that's a parliamentary actually level act uh, on uh, uh, changing one's uh, sex, um, birth uh, sex and Istanbul convention and the uh, banning gender studies. These are probably the most, ah, the latest one. Oh yes, the latest Yes, one. I was gonna sorry, say. Sorry. Oh, the, the, the most exciting one. No, nah, it's not a good word for them. The most, um, um, concerning uh, everyday culture, uh, high culture, popular culture, so all walks of life. This is to, uh, in the summer, this is just a government uh, order uh, saying that anything which is uh, print or presents, uh, I quote, behavior inconsistent with traditional gender roles should be uh, marked, right? So if somebody sells, produces a book or any art, uh, artistic product, most importantly books, which has non-heterosexual, um, uh, non-traditional gender roles in it should be marked, actually covered and even marked that it has a poisonous con uh, content, if you wish. So these are the most important legislative uh, changes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that all of those are Incredible, that, but the last is one of the most, just, just to try to, um, to ban the depiction and keep the depiction of any kind of non-traditional -trad gender relationships um, out of the schools, out of like, so I think under 18, you're not, it's, it's, you're not allowed to expose anyone under 18 to anything. Yeah, there, there is another aspect. You are not supposed to get any sexual, so the sexual uh, yeah. education. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, let's, let's, uh, we have, we have one request, which I'll get to, but one request that you, if it's possible to share in the chat your, um, your, the PDFs of your slides, uh, if you would be willing to do that. Um, I was going to just 
ask you both about the role of the church um, um, in, in celebrating Trianon, uh, both Catholic, uh, Calvinist, Pentecostal, um, but Margit, maybe you could say something to that and then that maybe the church is it's too obvious for, for anti-gender, but. Yes, nevertheless, I think it's, it's also relevant uh, concerning the, the gender issue because uh, there is a very close relationship between the traditional so-called uh, so historic churches and, uh, and, and the state concerning, uh, concerning the gender uh, issue. Uh, concerning uh, concerning uh, uh, the, this historical commemorative uh, politics, I think that on the local level, the churches were really important supporting these commemorative events. And also if you enter in a locality, as I mentioned, most of the Hungarian localities get a, a new monument, Trianon monument, in most cases are in the garden or in front of the church, just in the middle of, of a village. So there's a very close relationship and also in commemorations. So uh, yes, this, this is the case of neo-traditionalism and this commemorative events, neo-traditionalism, neo-conservatism goes, uh, goes uh, hand in hand with, uh, with this commemorative. But thank you for this question. It was very important, Christine, yes. And that's the next thing, just because we're running out of time, this is a, a really big pivot, but also I think an important issue that you touched on was um, the number of people who have emigrated for work to Western Europe and how, so this is a complicated question I understand, but um, how both for people that have remained behind, how, um, how demoralizing it is that their children can't find decent work in Hungary and move abroad or have to move abroad or find um, better jobs abroad, uh, how that plays into this kind of politics. Mm -hmm. Also how also how Hungarians are received abroad and this the sorts of um, demeaning uh, experiences that Eastern Europeans receive in Western Europe and, and how that plays back, but also um, ideas they might be exposed to, people they might be exposed to, scenes they might be exposed to. So I, kn I know it's a, a complicated issue, but just if you would say a few things about, because it's such a big, uh, such a big thing. Um, I can start, but yeah, yeah please, please, please take, take, take it over. I think it's important um, to compare in this regard, um, Hungary with the other countries or certain other countries of the region because out-migration uh, after the so-called change of the regime was very important in certain countries. So let's uh, take the example of Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Moldova and, and, and others, even Slovakia or, um, or, or Poland. Uh, and it, it was not so important, the out-migration from, uh, from Hungary in the first two day, decades after the change of the regime, which has changed a lot in the last 10 years. So we don't know very exactly the number. Nevertheless, it's somewhere between 400,000 and 600,000. Uh, which was previously not more than 200,000. So the increase was about half a million people uh, who, the, the majority of whom, uh, uh, about whom we don't know whether they, they left the country uh, for their whole life or they, they are commuting, sometimes they will come back or not. So there is an, an uncertainty in this regard. Nevertheless, it was important. Concerning uh, their, uh, their uh, impact, uh, political impact back to Hungary is not so clear the situation. So uh, um, if we consider uh, the votes, so how they have voted, uh, a good part of them voted for Fidesz and even more for far right. I know much better uh, the, uh, the case of the Hungarians living in Germany. Uh, there the difference uh, was, was, was bigger because uh, 
a good majority of them voted um, voted for uh, for the the oppositional parties uh, and for the momentum. Uh, and this is also very important that, similarly to other uh, East Central European diasporas, uh, so we also have already parties which have been created somehow in the, in the diaspora and who are supported by the young generation living in diaspora. I think this is really important in that, yes. Just one sentence from the, uh, the, the, the thinking on gender and the resonating or resisting, right? So uh, right-wing radical mobilization against gender, gender equality in particular. Um, I, I'm afraid we know very little. So you need uh, social media research or, or, or other types of qualitative research to, uh, to know more. Um, the, the political diversity market explained, most likely it is diverse in the same way as their political views, but um, I, I, I admit we know very little. I myself, it's just, uh, I wish we know more of that. Um, oh, finally, I'm getting, <laughs> I wasn't able to see the chats. Okay. Uh huh. And I mean, in the meantime, we are sending the, I cannot upload, yeah, yes. cannot upload, but sending to you and maybe you can upload. I'm just looking forward to it. So um, we only have a few more minutes, but but um, we have one comment about Trianon and, and the sense that, that Trianon has lessened in domestic politics in recent years. Um, the question is that Hungarians do not believe reclaiming the lost lands is either realistic or necessarily desirable, but the significance of Hungarian min minorities abroad and their right to vote in Hungary has increased as a political wedge issue, an important component for the government strategy for remaining in power. So that the this um, to just respond to this commentator's sense that in recent years, the political salience of Trianon has perhaps lessened less important um whether it's less important that that was the assumption i think uh i think this is this is not the case uh, this is not the case so uh it's used as a as a symbolic tool uh, i think it's less uh, the way how it is uh how it is uh, presented, how it is used in the public commemoration uh, uh, event, commemorative events is less radical uh, than before. I think it was part of the question whether those people who support or who, uh, who think about this, uh, who uh, invent this commemorative uh, uh, cult, uh, cult uh, they are really willing to change the boundaries, the state boundaries. I think this is not the case. Uh, they, they just, they just uh, use a symbolic toolkit, which was illegitimate uh, to use before. And, uh, and it's also partly uh, to create a, 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 a support and to create a, a symbolic toolkit for re the ethnic reunification, which means the ethnicization of the nation concept, and uh, and the support uh, for for changing the, uh, the the citizenship law. So uh, we have one more mil we have one million uh, Hungarian citizens who are not living in this country, and this is legitimized by this historical commemorative event. Yeah. I mean, I think, so thank you. I think that's really, really insightful. Yes, you don't have people who want to necessarily go to war with Romania or, or Slovakia. Um, that's not on the table at all, but at the same time there's, so it's, it's mobilized for, as you, as you so well point out, for all kinds of other reasons, um, right? Okay, I'm afraid that we have to, we, we've come to the end of the session. Thank you so much for joining us um, and, we hope you we we hope to see you here in person sometime soon. <laughs> that would be nice. We are ready for that. Yes. <laughs> yes. It would be yeah. nice. And we send the PPTs, so please. Okay, so yeah. um, we'll email. It was unable to uh, upload, but it, in your email, Christina. 
Oh, to my email. Okay, okay. And then we'll try to maybe attach them somehow to the to the final thing. Okay, thank you so much. Applause. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much for your invitation and for the discussion. It was a pleasure.